In uh, 2003, uh, uh, an artist called Stacey Arrico, she released a song called More to Life. And in that, we see there's this heart cry that's revealed that maybe you can relate to at different points in your life. She says, there's got to be more to life than chasing down every temporary high to satisfy me. Because the more that I'm tripping out thinking there must be more to life, well, it's life, but I'm sure there's got to be more. I'm wanting more. My experience of life has left me thinking there's got to be something more than what I currently know. Can you relate to that? Maybe those online, can you relate to that? Or perhaps you're thinking, Stacey Rico, 2003, what do you want about? Well, that's okay. Let's go to you too. In 1987, who said, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The song speaks about this journey of desiring to know that there's, there's something of fulfillment. The, the world makes sense. I'm where I'm supposed to be. And I've tried lots of different stuff, including religion. And it hasn't left me satisfied. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I think that's the human cry. I think that's what we live with. And friends, as we've been journeying through this Great Expectations series over the last few weeks, and if you're joining us for the first time today, I would encourage you to go back, find our YouTube channel or our website, and, and watch the messages. I've been greatly encouraged uh, by what we've been able to reflect on in the series. But this idea that we can have a great expectation in the promises of God, that God is a God who's made promises to us that we can know and understand, and we've seen that in the history of his relationship with his chosen people, Israel, and we're seeing that unfold for us. And in that journey, we've discovered that we can know and put a great expectation in God's promise of a new identity for us, that he names us and calls us his own, that he did that with the people of Israel. You're no longer slaves. You're going to be a holy priesthood. You're going to be kings. You're going to be my people. And he says the same of us, and we experience this through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've also learned that we can have a great expectation in God's promise of provision. That because God has given us this new identity, he sees us as his children. And he's a good father. And as a good father who loves his children, he's going to do what he can to provide for us, for our needs. Not all our wants, but our needs. And we also have been learning about how we can have a great expectation in God's promise of his presence. That for the people of Israel, as they were being released from slavery under the leadership of Moses, that they, were knew, they knew but knew that God's presence was among them. It was tangible, physical, visible, Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. Lots of ways that God made his presence known. And we marveled at how God has continued to process that to the point where through Christ we know that God not only dwells amongst us and goes with us, but he dwells in us. And then we can know his presence. And what a lovely sense of the presence of God, certainly for me, as we move through our worship time this morning. These are great promises. But there is another great expectation in a promise that God has that we see in the history of the people of Israel that comes to beautiful fulfillment in the here and the now. Keeping in mind this background thought, are you able to relate to this idea that I still haven't found what I'm looking for and there must be more to life, the deep inner dissatisfaction that sometimes we carry in our human condition. There's this great promise that we see made to the people of God. And we find this recorded in many places, but in one place it's in Exodus 13, 3 to 5. This is as they are going through their liberation and out into freedom. Through Moses, God reminds his people. It says, Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today, in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. 
When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, listen to this, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you to observe this ceremony. And here is this reference to this great promise that has been made to these people of a promised land. And that in God, we can have this great expectation of his promise of the promised land. Now, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And I know what you might be thinking. Okay, Adam, you just told us that we can have a promise. uh, We can lean on this promise of the promised land. But where's my promised land? I don't know that I'm experiencing milk and honey right now. In fact, last week I was so concerned about the second swimming pool appearing in my backyard that life was a little tough. Maybe I had some stuff come into my house. Maybe I had some friends who've gone through some hardship. Maybe life is a little challenging in the economy. Maybe there's some stuff going on that's really hard. Maybe I've got tough relationships with people that should be more respectful. Maybe I've got, who knows what I've got? Where's my milk and honey land? Have you ever thought that? Maybe not in those words, because we're human, right? We get pretty upset when things aren't the way we like them, especially when we live in a time and an era and a place where we get to have things the way we like them often. And so we're kind of used to getting what we want. And when life doesn't serve it up, it can be quite challenging for us. But I want you to know that there is a promise that God made to his people of a promised land. And it would be a land flowing with milk and honey. Not because the place called Canaan is particularly a place. If if you've been to modern Israel, it has some patches of, of great abundance and fruitfulness and fertile places. But actually, big chunks of it are arid desert or frozen mountains. Hardly a land you would call flowing with milk and honey. However, the promise of the promised land is about God's identity for his people, his provision for them, and his presence with them. And the land would be flowing with milk and honey as God dwelt with them in it, not without him. There was a requirement for receiving the promised land of being with God in it for it to be a land flowing with milk and honey. My friends, today I want to put to you this promise stands for us. We have a promised land. We can live in it despite sometimes the challenges that we know. And to kind of frame this up for you, I just want to share with you a John Piper quote. John Piper, a pastor, an author, a thinker, he says this. He says, The deepest longing of the human heart is to know and enjoy the glory of God. We were made for this. That this deep longing for something more than we know actually has its origins in this deep created desire in us to know God and be known by God and to understand the glory of God. And that causes us to long for something more than perhaps we know, which makes the promise of a promised land all the more promising. There was three promisings in one sentence. Our hope can be firmly rooted in this promise You might be thinking, well, how does that work, Adam? How do we get a promised land? What does that look like for you and for me? And so the Apostle Paul, who was this great Christian leader and thinker in the first century, shaped the church, taught the church, planted many churches. In a letter to the church in Galatia, he writes this in chapter 3. He says, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, the offspring, the generations to come. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to his seed, uh, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Paul is pointing to this, and all that can be a bit confusing, is that the promise given to Abraham and the ancient people of Israel is fully fulfilled through Jesus and relationship with him. And we have access to that. 
He goes on in verses 26 to 29 to say, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What Paul is making clear is that the promise these people received, all of the promises we've been talking about, but particularly this promise of a promised land dwelling with God, a land flowing with milk and honey, a life flowing with milk and honey, is made possible and fulfilled in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's great news. It's great news. My friends, you have a promise of a promised land and you can have it. You can know it. You can live it. For it is God's purpose for you. But here's the challenge for us. Is that our promised land is both now and not yet. It is both now and not yet. And it's an interesting tension to live with the now and the not yet of our promised land. It's not yet in the sense that the fullness of that being established happens as God brings the fullness of his kingdom at the end of times into full fruition and we see the renewal of all things, new heaven, new earth, no fears, no tears, no sin, rightness with God and all of that unfolding amongst us. That's a beautiful thing and that is to come for all of creation. That's still to come. It's the sense for us of of hope in heaven. The Apostle Paul, he again writes in another letter to the church in Corinth, he says this. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Interesting. Let's ask a question here. What prize? Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Our life in Christ is a life that lasts forever and is fulfilled in the forever, in the sense it is to come. It's, in a sense, not yet, but we have great hope. Can I just encourage you? I think for me, this helps me live a life with perspective. That the promised land that I am promised fulfilled in Christ, actually is something that I can look forward to as much as I can experience it now. I can look forward to the fullness of it. There will be more flowing milk and more flowing honey in the fullness of heaven. It's a bit of a challenging thought if you don't particularly like milk. You're like, Adam, I'm dairy intolerant. This is not a good analogy that was chosen. Adam, I'm vegan. I can't eat honey. You understand the rhetoric a land of abundance, a land of plenty, a land where all of our desire that God has given us is fulfilled. It is to come. So when life is challenging in the here and the now, I can find great resilience, not because I'm only about. My hope is not just in the here and the now. My hope is anchored in something that goes on forever. Where, right, where wrongs are made right, where justice reigns, where grace is perfect. Hope is fulfilled. Love is endless. I can live with perspective. So what I'm struggling with here and now, yeah, it's a struggle. We want to minimize that. But actually, I can anchor that and find resilience in this hope of a not yet that will be fulfilled. You know, I found that this perspective has been really, really helpful for me in my life. In times of great pain, in times where I've failed, in times where others have failed me, to be able to go beyond the immediacy of my circumstance and to be able to say, actually, there's a not yet that I believe is coming, that's promised will come, and everything will be made right. Everything will be made okay. Okay, it's difficult right now. I'm going through my year 12 exams. By the way, did you know I did year 12 twice? I got really good at it. <laughs> Didn't do well enough the first time around. Too busy playing basketball and chasing, being chased by girls. Chasing girls. <laughs> the narrative changes in my mind over time. 
that I did not perform to my utmost and it was a devastating time for a young man. Learned a lot of lessons, but what I learned was to place my hope not in this immediate moment that seemed out of control, but in the not yet to come because God had promised me a full and abundant life and that that was a forever promise that was working its way out as I followed Jesus. So in a sense, not yet, but it's also now. And you know, today is Palm Sunday. It's the day where we remember Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And the reason we celebrate that is because we know where it leads, not because it was awesome in itself, yeah? Not because Palm Sunday in itself was some massive thing, other than we realize that Jesus would be betrayed because the people who were cheering him on would be amongst the very people who would actually tear him down. But it does remind us that knowing what was to unfold, Jesus still rode into Jerusalem. And he knew what was coming. He absolutely knew. It wasn't a surprise to him. Listen to how he talks to his disciples in the lead up in Mark 10. He says, They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside, the 12 disciples, and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man, referring to himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, and three days later he will rise. So when Jesus on that donkey rode into Jerusalem just a few days ahead of what was to unfold, he absolutely knew what was going to transpire. And here's the marvelous truth of this, is he knew that just days later what would transpire would open the door to the promised land for all people of all time. He knew that what would transpire in what we describe as Easter and celebrate celebrate retrospectively would actually be the ushering in and the fulfillment, the key to the door to open up forever the road to the promised land. It would be the fulfillment, the act that would bring the fulfillment of the right now so that as people journeyed into relationship with Jesus Christ because he died for their sin, he stood in their place and then he conquered death by rising from the grave that because of this gift, we could all now know in the here and the now the start of our promised land. Let's not go through the motions this Easter. It is too profound because our promised land is now through Christ and not yet because there's a fulfillment of his kingdom to come. And that can give us great hope and perspective now and in the days to come. So what this means is that because through Christ we can know the promised land, we can know some elements of what our promised land looks like. And I want to put to you today that our promised land, our land flowing with milk and honey, is a land flowing with forgiveness and freedom. A land where our sins are done away with. A land where we're no longer enslaved to it. In fact, Jesus, he made this uh, confirmation that this is what he had come to do when early on in his ministry, he went to a synagogue and sat down and because he was a visiting rabbi, they handed him the opportunity to speak. And so he picked up the old scroll of the ancient prophet Isaiah and he said these words. We pick this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and unrolling it, He found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Freedom for the prisoners. Who's he referring to? You and me. In prison to what? Our sin and hopelessness and despair. Our brokenness and recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the word that's used here in the ancient language, in that that word favor, and here it's the Hebrew, that word favor, it, it means acceptance. I'm here to proclaim the year of the Lord's acceptance of you. He's saying, I'm here to set you free from sin. I am here. It's fulfilled in your hearing what's going on because that's what he goes on to say. He says this and then he like drops the mic. I'm here to make this all happen. 
He's saying, I've come to set people free and I've come to let them know that God can accept them because what's going to happen is I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to stand in their place. I'm going to conquer death. And so when God looks at them, he'll only see my perfection and they'll be embraced just as if they'd always been me, just as if they'd always been Jesus. Our promised land is freedom and forgiveness. It's freedom and forgiveness. And when you know this, It is transformative. So if you're feeling bound up, if you're feeling imprisoned, if you're feeling like there's got to be more to life than this, could I encourage you to consider stepping into the promised land? Because these things that weigh you down have been paid for. They've been dealt with through Christ. The other thing is our promised land is peace. It's peace. From the striving to have everything right, from the striving to make things right ourselves, from the striving to somehow make that emptiness that causes us to create songs like I still haven't found what I'm looking for, all of the striving to try and feel that deep need inside that John Piper spoke to about that's actually a need for desiring God and to know him and to know his glory. When we try to fill that with other stuff, it leads to angst. It leads to turmoil, but our promised land is peace because Jesus said, I'm here to proclaim your acceptance and I'm the one that makes your acceptance possible. You don't have to earn my love. Just let me say that again because we can hear that, but I really believe online and in the room, there are some people that need to know this deeply. You don't need to earn God's love. Stop trying. It'll burn you out. It'll leave you insecure. It'll lead you challenged. It'll lead you empty. It'll leave you in lots of damaged ways. You don't have to earn it. It is freely yours. It is a gift. And so with that, we can know peace because we don't have to strive anymore. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You're accepted by God. You're loved by God. And he goes on and we hear these words just a couple of chapters later in John 16. He says this. This is a really encouraging promise. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble. Perspective. The now and the not yet. In the now you're still going to have some trouble. In the not yet it's all going to be good. In this world you'll have trouble but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is Jesus' promise. There's nothing you're going through that God isn't bigger than. We have a promise of peace in the promised land. Our promised land is freedom and forgiveness. Our promised land is a land of peace. And the last thing I just want to share with you today, as we think about our promised land available to us through Jesus, is that our promised land is a life of purpose. It's a life of purpose. It's a life where we get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It's just so good. Our promised land is a life of power. What could that be? Well, it could be lots of things as we take the unique shape that God has created you with to play a part in the fabric of things, to make a difference in the world. And it doesn't have to look like someone else's Instagram profile. It doesn't have to look as perfect as someone's social media story. It doesn't have to look like this leader or that person or these people that seem to have it all together. It's your unique shape that God has given to you in the identity that he's given to you, in the presence that he brings to us, in the promise of his provision and his promised land. You being the best, you in Christ making a difference in the world is part of the purpose we get to live with. This was such a freeing reality for me in my life. I've had to revisit this a number of times in my life to say, okay, God, I just want to be more and more like your son, Jesus. Jesus changed me, shaped me. And he's saying, I am shaping you. Oh, well, it's a faith statement sometimes because I get up, I look in the mirror of my life sometimes and I go, oh, there's so much work to be done. But I've been able to see God slowly working away in me and this revelation that he's shaped me uniquely. 
a truth that was presented to me as a 19-year-old that I by faith believed in and then have continued to study that he's shaping each and every one of us for significance because his promised land is a life of purpose. I'm so glad that you don't have to be like anybody else. And I'm so glad that I don't have to be like anybody else. God has a purpose for me and he's put me together and he's put you together for that purpose. But all of that is part of a bigger fabric of purpose. And again, the Apostle Paul just gives one good perspective on this amongst many perspectives we can find in Scripture. In writing to the church in Corinth, he says this in chapter 5 in his second letter. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us. It's not that God might make his appeal through us. He is making his appeal through us, through the way that he's created us. As we step into life in him in the promised land that he's given us, he is making his appeal through us. Here's the good news. You're appealing. He's making this appeal through us. So what is in the broader fabric of things our shape contributing to? It's to this purpose where promised land ushers. We're ushering people towards the promised land. Someone comes into your life and as you talk to them, what you hear in their words as they wrestle through life is this, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh, well, that's okay. This way to the promised land. Two seats, great. They come in and the narrative of their life as they engage with you and as you love them, as they're in orbit in your world. You know, there's got to be more to life than chasing down every temporary high. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. This way to the promised land. Come and find a land flowing with milk and honey in your inner life both in the here and the now. And as together the now of the promised land in our life, God's presence in us through Christ, as it grows and together we live out the reality of the promised land, more and more people get to see what it might look like. We're pilgrims on the way to a promised end. We have a promised land available and we're promised land ushers. Now, it might be that you're here and you're online with us or you're here in the room and you're like, Adam, I, I, I believe I've stepped into the promised land by faith in a relationship with Jesus. And you're thinking, well, I don't always feel like that. I'd love to pray for you today that you might have a fresh reassurance that this is where you're living. It might be because in the here and the now, life is a bit tumultuous You're like, I just want to know the perspective of that peace that the promised land brings, the freedom and forgiveness and and the purpose that comes with that. But it might be too that you've never thought you could know a promised land like that. And I just want to make space before we close up and finish up and go on fellowship, which is a beautiful thing to do, for anyone who would like to say, Adam, I want to step into the promised land of life in Jesus Christ. So why don't you join with me in prayer. For those online, you might like to close your eyes, bow your heads, just make a moment. Let's make this a holy moment, a holy space. Let's not rush from what God might be saying to us. Lord, we want to thank you that you've made the spiritual promise, the tangible promise of a promised land to the ancient Israelites, a promise that's true for us and for all people who know you, 
who lay down our lives before you and find our real life in your life. And Lord, for those of us who struggle with some turmoil in life right now, and we have seasons, all of us, Lord, for those who perhaps feel like the land they're in is a land that's shaky or a land of uncertainty, Lord, I pray that as they experience you, as they know you, as they've made a commitment to you in the past, that you might allow the land of milk and honey, those traits, the peace, the freedom and forgiveness and the purpose to flood in even now by your spirit. A peace that surpasses all understanding because it flies in the face of our circumstances. Lord, would you let that peace enter our hearts in a fresh and deep way here and now, in every heart in this room and online with us. Lord, would you do that? Thank you, Lord. While we're in this attitude of prayer, my encouragement, just receive that. Receive that afresh. A peace, the knowledge of freedom and forgiveness. Lord, breathe in us a fresh sense of purpose to walk out who you've created us to be. And while we're in this attitude of prayer, it might be that you are here or you're online with us and you've never really ever chosen to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to step into that promised land, that existence with him that starts now and is fulfilled in all of its fullness in eternity to come. And if that is you and you're this morning or this afternoon, whenever you're seeing this, if you're wanting to enter into that, then I just invite you to simply pray in your heart a prayer after me like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for opening the door to the promised land to me. By dying for my sin and by conquering death. I choose to step through that door in you and receive you as my Lord and Saviour. And I welcome in the Holy Spirit and the peace and the freedom and the purpose that comes with that. Lord, I just pray for anyone who's made that decision today. Lord, would you bless them, encourage them and protect them. And Lord, would you continue to prepare our hearts as we journey from this day to next weekend where we will remember all the events of Easter, where all of this took place. And we thank you for your love and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're online, a button will appear that just says, I want to commit my life to Christ. And I'd encourage you to click on that and make yourself known to our host. If you're here in the room, and you prayed that for the first time, then you've got a couple of options. I'm going to linger towards the front at the close of the service. You could come and make yourself known to me, or you could make your way across to the welcome studio and make yourself known to them. They'd love to just connect with you, perhaps even pray with you. We'd love to do that. Feel free. You don't have to. We're going to sing in a moment, but you don't have to rush off. We'd love for you to just linger around our property in the courtyard or outside. Just get to know some people. But don't waste the moment or the opportunity. Right now we're going to stand and sing and we're going to join with all of those people who gathered and waved palm branches, who called out to the coming king. We're going to say, you're welcome here. Hosanna. Why don't you stand with us as we do that now?